Welcome to American Indian Living, a program developed by the Native Education and Health Initiative to improve and enhance the health of people throughout the Native communities. American Indian Living is hosted by Dr. David DeRose, a board-certified specialist in both internal medicine and preventive medicine. Dr. DeRose has a wide range of experience with Native health issues, and he's ready today to help you learn more about your health. Here's Dr. DeRose. Welcome to American Indian Living. I'm Dr. David DeRose. Today we're speaking about a subject that resonates throughout Indian country. It's the topic of trauma related to the boarding school experience. With me today are some experts in this area. The first one is Brett Lee Shelton. Brett is a staff attorney with the Native American Rights Fund. Brett, it's great to have you on today's show. Hi, David. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Brett, you and I met in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2013 at the National Congress of American Indians. Tell us a little bit about what you and your organization were doing there. Uh, The Native American Rights Fund has recently redoubled its efforts in working towards healing from the boarding school policy that impacted Native Americans uh, starting in the the mid-1800s. As part of the plan for that, um, we wanted to make sure that people at NCAI knew what was going on and that we had the blessing of the organization for for what our plan was. And so uh, we were uh, following up after having been, uh, after NCAI had passed a resolution in support of the work that we're going to be doing um, in their mid-year meeting in Reno. And so you and I met in Tulsa, and that's where we were just kind of keeping, keeping the ideas fresh there and letting people know what was going on. Tremendous. Now, Brett, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got engaged in this work personally. Well, ever ever since I went to law school, I knew I was going to come out and, and help the people, basically, as my family called it, in Indian country. Um, it's been a long path to the boarding school issue, particularly, but I was really excited when NARF wanted me to work on it, um, because I actually had a couple great-grandmothers who got sent away to Carlisle, and uh, I grew up hearing their stories. They actually knew each other. They got sent over there from South Dakota, and they had uh, divergent experiences there. I remember one great-grandmother was very proud of the time that she had spent in Pennsylvania going to school, and and, uh, she evidently had a good experience about it, but then the other one disliked it so much that she found her way back to South Dakota, and it ends up that her family established their own family school so that none of the kids would ever have to go away to boarding school anymore. Wow. So, uh pretty intense experience both ways, I guess, and pretty formative for both of those great-grandmothers of mine. And you've brought some other people into the dialogue, not just for today's show, but in the broader context. But today, one of your colleagues is joining us. Tell us a little bit about who else we've got on today's program, Brett. Yeah, and actually, you know, I'm, I'm a newcomer con- uh, compared to our guest, <laughs> our other guest. Um, along with me is Denise Lajimodier who's from the Turtle Mountain Chippewa people. And Denise has been active in this area for a long time. She was among some of the some of the leaders in the boarding school healing project uh, early on prior to this project that NARF is taking on. There's been a handful of people in Indian country working the boarding schools issues for, for quite a while, and Denise is one of those, and she's actually pursued it from her academic career standpoint as well. So she's done a lot of hard-hitting work in the area. And right now she's the leader of... Uh, of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, which is a coalition of these people who have been active in the area for a long time that was formed in 2011 after a symposium on the boarding schools was convened in Boulder, Colorado by the Native American Rights Fund, the Boarding School Healing Project, and the Universities of Colorado and Wyoming Schools of Law. Well, this is exciting to have an organization that's really focused on healing from the trauma, the very real trauma that has come out of this whole experience. Denise, this is just not an academic study for you. You have personally lived with this and and worked with people who've been seriously impacted by this whole uh, boarding school experience and the historical trauma that's gone along with it. Tell us a little bit about your story. Yes, uh, bonjour, hello, and thank you for the invitation to uh, be here today. My journey through this started with my parents. Both my parents were sent to boarding school along with uh, my grandparents. And in 1977, I interviewed my father just before he died uh, about boarding schools, and he just told a horrific story of abuse from when he was sent as a little boy. He was nine years old. 
before he was literally captured by Indian agents on the Trim Mountain Reservation in 1925 and sent three days and three nights on a train to Chamawa, Oregon. Wow. So he told stories of being hungry, of working in the barns, working in the fields, of child labor, of learning carpentry, tinsmithing. He, he never tried to run away, but uh, there was a lot of physical abuse. He was nearly beaten to death mm. by something called the gauntlet. He survived that, but I don't think he ever survived the physical and emotional scars that happened to him during those four years that he was there. And then my mom was sent to South Dakota to a boarding school there. Her brothers and sisters were also sent to Marty. And um, I, I have a 90-year-old uncle that I'm going to go out in about a week, and I'd like to visit with him some more. I started interviewing him a few years ago after I interviewed my 90-year-old auntie mm-hmm. that was uh, sent to Marty. But my uncle became very, very angry, and he had had heart attacks. And so I stopped the interview. I was, mm-hmm. I was afraid for, for his health. Mm-hmm. And then uh, once I became a professor, I did an IRB and got permission to start interviewing boarding school survivors. And I put something in the newspaper, tribal newspapers, for them to call me if they would like to tell their story. So I have over 20 pretty horrific stories that document the human rights abuses that happened at, at boarding schools. And th- there is something that I call secondary trauma. It was, it was very difficult for me to hear their stories. Mm-hmm. One thing I learned was that I am called a generational since I was not sent to boarding school, that I still suffer from the effects of what happened to my parents. I never could figure out why we were never told we were loved and we mm-hmm. were never hugged. And mm-hmm. uh, now I understand why, because of what they went through in boarding school. There was no hugging or, or love there. Why we worked so hard, why we were whipped and beaten and mm-hmm. made to kneel in the corner. That was the discipline my parents experienced. And why my father became alcoholic. I think he has what, again, it was like a punch in the stomach when I read information on intergenerational trauma. There's something, a term called soul wound. And uh, I believe my father was, his soul was very much wounded mm-hmm. by his boarding school experiences. Denise, this is uh, such a a difficult subject, I know, for many people who've lived through it and many of the children and grandchildren to share about. The very fact that people are opening up about it, some would say, indicates only the tip of the iceberg because some of the people who were most traumatized can't even do that. Is that a uh, a reasonable conclusion to draw based on some of the things you've experienced and some of the things you've seen in the research? Yes, absolutely. When I was trying to send out my my qualitative study to referee journals that were Native American journals, they said, well, you're speaking to the choir. We, we know this. We've heard this. And I believe that they were absolutely wrong uh, mm. because of the resounding silence that is in Indian country mm. amongst Native people. The people that I interviewed, almost all of them had never spoken about their boarding school experience. Wow. And some of them just whispered to me about the sexual abuse. And that was one of the questions I asked. I never asked it about my father, to my father and my mom when I interviewed them, or my aunt and uncle. But uh, the boarding school healing project, it was on their protocol. And it was a question I would, I would never have thought of asking myself. Mm-hmm. And almost every one of the people I interviewed were sexually abused, and it was extraordinarily hard for them to talk about wow. it. One woman said, I don't know why I'm telling you. And she was whispering, even though we were in this huge house by ourselves. Uh And I said, I know why you're telling me, because I asked. Mm -hmm. And so I would send their transcribed interview back to them to make sure if they wanted to add anything or delete anything. Many of my interviewees said, I don't want it back. I don't want my kids to ever know this. I don't want my grandkids to ever see this. I've had to think about this every day of my life. I don't want them to have to think about it. Hmm. So, and I was talking to my cousin who's over 60 years old about his boarding school experience, and his daughter walked by, and she said, Papa, I didn't know you went to boarding school. So I think maybe in academia we're aware of boarding school and, you know, historical trauma and intergenerational trauma and all those terms, um, PTSD and so on. But down, you know, on the reservations, in our homes, with our grandparents and our parents, I think it's still... Uh, an issue that is kept under wraps because of the issue of shame, mostly about the sexual abuse. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I want people out there to 
ask questions, to ask their elders, to get out their tape recorders, to tape record. The thing that happens, though, and why I won't interview anymore, is that people, they become re-traumatized in telling their stories. Mm -hmm. Part of my IRB, I had to put in that I would encourage them to seek counseling. But some of them didn't even want to go see a doctor or a counselor because they, they told me, what will they think about me? I was, I was sexually molested. They're going to think I'm a terrible person. Mm -hmm. So there, when you talk about healing, we need a tremendous amount of counseling specifically aimed at any type of methods or counseling methods that would help boarding school survivors to, um, to talk and to heal. Someone had said, we're only as healthy as our secrets. Well, a lot of our Native people, from 50 on up, some of the boarding schools in the 70s were still pretty rough with, with abuse. Mm -hmm. They need still to talk about the horrors that, that they went through, but then they need somebody there right there with them because they can become suicidal. Well, this is, I think, a big question, both uh, Denise and Brett, and, and why I was excited to have you on the show. We have this common sense throughout Indian country of the trauma from the whole boarding school experience, but there's not a lot of emphasis on healing from it. Like you said, it's often not talked about. If it is talked about, what kind of resources do we have? How does this help someone to verbalize or to even seek help? As you mentioned, we, we know in the, in the field that when someone is abused, they often tend to blame themselves. They somehow think there was something wrong with them. They were being punished for, even if it's totally irrational, it often becomes internalized. And so, what kind of things are you seeing either in your experience with individuals or in your research that gives you some courage to say, we have to address these issues, we have to bring it out, we have to have some systemic program for addressing it because there is hope and there is help? I can speak to that. I had the extraordinary experience of working with Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commissioners. There's three of them. And I sat in on a week-long a healing session and a session where it's, it's the truth part of the truth and reconciliation in a community in Whitehorse, Yukon, mm -hmm. where they took testimony, but they had all kinds of psychiatrists, psychologists, medicine people, whatever that community decided they needed there for healing. The churches were also there with their apology and in a separate room, um, people that didn't want to give their testimony in front of a crowd were, were often in a, a different room. They had a sacred fire going. But in Canada, with the, with the monies that were given out there in, in their settlement to boarding school survivors there, they also went to communities and they asked them, what does healing look like for your community? Hmm. And in a study I read, say one community would have a talking circle mm -hmm. where they would be able to talk about the abuse with, within that circle. So th that, you know, we, haven't got, we haven't gotten to the truth part yet. We need to still go around. The, the United States is very far behind Canada when it comes to dealing with this issue. And uh, so we just we need to get the truth part, and then we need to visit with communities, uh, you know, throughout the United States of what healing would look like. What, what do they want? What do they need to heal from, from this? In, in my community, we're, we're about 98% Catholic, so maybe it would be church ceremonies, but there are many people that are, that are still very traditional with the, the Ojibwe traditions. So we need, but, we, but first of all, we need to, to be aware of that this is what happened to us and this is what we're going, this is what we're going through. I did not know what was happening to me. When I saw the term intergenerational trauma, I had never seen that term before and it hit me like, just like, you know, kicking the stomach. It's like, oh my goodness, that's, that's me. That's, that's what's happening to me. Um, and then it helped me to, to just do some healing myself and some forgiving. Uh, help me understand my mom and my dad and what they went through and why we were raised the way we were. So we still need to get into communities and open up conversations in whichever healthy way we can or whatever way the communities want to just talk about. But we need the truth out there first. And between truth and reconciliation is a long, long, long process, a lot of steps before we get there. Well, we've got time to talk about some of those steps, not to solve all the problems, of course, but we do have to step away. We're slipping into our first break during today's edition of American Indian Living. We're going to be back with our special guests, uh, Denise Lajmodir and Brett Shelton. Don't you go away. A lot more about healing trauma from the boarding school experience. Stay tuned for more. I'm Dr. DeRose.
Today's broadcast has been pre-recorded. However, if you have questions about today's show or would like further information, please call 1-800-775-HOPE. That's 1-800-775-4673. We'll be right back after this. Today's American Indian Living radio program is sponsored in part by Weimar Center of Health and Education. Located in the foothills of Northern California's Sierra Mountains, Weimar is home to the residential New Start Lifestyle Program that helps people of all races address diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and related conditions. To further assist Native Americans with their health, Weimar produces a wealth of free resources that can be accessed on their website at newstartclub.com. To learn more about how Weimar can change your life, you can call 1-800-525-9192. The number again is 1-800-525-9192. Or you can access them on the web at newstartclub.com. Again, that's newstartclub.com. Some important social statements by United States citizens today on policy. To be a good American, you've got to like people, share things, and not scream at people. And you should also help them, and then you can share at them. A statement on historical tradition and our form of government. I love America because, because it got government full of people and full of people. And full of people. A statement on down-to-earth American idealism. I like living in America because it means freedom. It means that you can do most stuff you want as long as it doesn't, like, hurt anybody and, and you have to work hard to keep it. America, a statement in summary. I love America because, because everybody's equal. And when you play with other kids and they dunk you, you can dunk them back. You're listening to Dr. David DeRose on American Indian Living. Your comments and questions are welcome. Call now at 1-800-775-HOPE, 1-800-775-4673. Here again is Dr. DeRose. Welcome back to American Indian Living. I'm Dr. David DeRose. We're speaking about healing from the trauma of boarding schools, forced boarding school experience in Indian country. Denise Lajemodere from North Dakota State University, and Brett Shelton. Brett, who's with NARF, is helping us in today's dialogue. Uh, NARF is the Native American Rights Fund, if you're not familiar with that organization. Brett, we've been throwing out a term in our first segment that we really haven't adequately defined, and that is this term of intergenerational or historical trauma. What is that all about? Yeah, that's an important concept, and, and the idea is that if somebody experiences a trauma and doesn't get healed from the impact of that trauma, the trauma can be passed on to their children and to their children and so on until somebody heals from the trauma. So it can actually be passed down to generations, and the implication here is that if somebody was traumatized at boarding school, for example, mm -hmm. that that could be passed on. The trauma from that experience at the boarding school could be passed on to the children, grandchildren, and so on of that person who was traumatized at boarding school. And what it what what this means is that even though a lot of the people who had to experience the traumas at the boarding schools may be gone from this world at this point, those traumas, if they hadn't been healed in the interim, could still be being experienced within their families and their communities. And in fact, this is something that's become apparent in Indian country, but, but we still have to work on raising awareness of it outside of Indian country. I always like to point out a quote from Kevin Gover when he was Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs in 2000. He, he, he observed that, and I'll say, quote, the trauma of shame, fear, and anger has passed from one generation to the next and manifests itself in the rampant alcoholism, drug abuse, and domestic violence that plague Indian country. Many of our people live lives of unrelenting tragedy as Indian families suffer the ruin of lives by alcoholism, suicides made of shame and despair, and violent death at the hands of one another. Now that was that was 13 years ago when he said that, but he was he was on to what we live with today 
as a result of what happened during the boarding schools, which is basically our ancestors lived through a policy of cultural genocide, and we're still feeling it because we haven't had a chance at reconciliation and healing from that. So, Brett, is it safe to say that the way this is passed on is through behavioral responses, through practices like we heard Denise describing in the previous segment, uh, or is it also just the memory of a whole culture being traumatized, not just the way a person was raised because of parents that were traumatized or grandparents that were traumatized from the boarding schools? Well, there's a few things going on, and you're touching on one that's sort of a grieving of a culture that's been attacked and, and lost to some extent, you know, varying extents depending on your tribe. So there's that kind of grieving notion, but it's actually the trauma itself that gets passed on as well. Now, now it, in one respect, when children were taken from homes and taken to a boarding school far away and not allowed to be at the home, they lost parenting skills, especially parenting skills within the context of the tribal culture that they were stolen from. Mm-hmm. So that's one problem, is that parenting skills were lost to that generation and had to be, you know, they'd have to be relearned and so on. And, uh, you know, maybe they were or weren't able to, to relearn the parenting skills within each family from that particular tribal culture. But there's also, if you, if you talk to trauma scientists or people who actually study trauma that's uh, visited on people, they will tell you that the trauma can actually be passed on in the chemistry in other words, certain receptors in your brain are activated when you experience trauma because trauma triggers a fight, uh, a fight, flight, or freeze response in you mm. that activates certain stress hormones and, and receptors get turned on in your brain at a certain level. And that can actually be passed on to children if you don't go through some sort of a healing to, to help wash that away. So trauma scientists themselves are actually saying that, that this sort of a thing can be passed on, this kind of physiological response as well. Um, So that helps to answer the critics who would say, why do you want to worry about this boarding school stuff? Wasn't that a long time ago? Mm -hmm. Maybe so. Maybe it was a long time ago, but our communities are still feeling it, and Mm -hmm. people alive and living now still feel it. So, Denise, you've shared with us also how this is a very personal issue for you, and when you learned about the intergenerational effects, this really hit you with particular force. Yes, it did, and I was fortunate enough to um, be able to participate in an incredible ceremony with a gentleman called Don Coyhees and uh, the White Bison Initiative. He went from Tamawa boarding school across the country to different boarding schools all the way to Carlisle a few years ago. And I was able to sit in on a a healing ceremony, participate in in White Earth. And he has a hoop that has 100 feathers on it. And he went through uh, his program on boarding school, he had people come up and uh, testify, those that wanted to come up and testify as extremely moving men would stand up to testify and then double over in absolute pain and and sobbing as they told their stories. And again, he had uh, people in the other room that were able to be there for them immediately, counselors and so on. But it it was, in dancing that hoop out, he asked me to carry that hoop out. And it was, um, to me, it was it was time that I forgive my father. We weren't we weren't sexually abused or anything by my father, but he we were you know there was abuse there, and it was time to forgive him. And so it was a deeply personal uh, moment, and I I was able to finally sort of take that bitterness and anger and everything from my father and and, and put it away. So um, very thankful to him and and that ceremony for my my personal healing. And that's what Don talked about. How can I forgive anybody or myself or anything unless unless I forgive the unforgivable. And that's what he talks about, and that's what we need to do as, as Native people is, is to forgive. But I was able to be there in that ceremony and other spiritual ceremonies that, that I attend as an Indigenous person has helped me to become who I am. <laughs> mm-hmm. My brother and sister weren't, aren't, aren't so lucky. Um, they probably will die as alcoholics because of, of the way we were raised. So I was, I'm just very fortunate to, to be where I, where I am. And I, I always think I'm only one of hundreds of thousands of Native people out there that are generationals or that are still living uh, with the, the, the abuse from, from boarding schools. So we still we have a lot of work to do. So you, Denise and Brett, are two of the many people who are trying to get some of this work done. Tell us a little bit about the uh, the coalition 
that you are currently the president of Denise. Just give our, our listeners a little feel because some of them may want to become involved in some way in this National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Um, maybe I'll turn that over to Brett. If, uh, they, we've got uh, our bylaws and so on about how to become members. Do you have that handy, Brett? I, didn't, I don't have that in front of me. I don't have it right with me, mm -hmm. but... Uh... We could summarize the the coalition had its first annual meeting at uh, at NCAI or you know during NCAI in Tulsa, and it'll have one annual meeting per year, and um, there are also teleconference meetings and and board meetings. So, you know, there's directors to the organization who keep it running and so on too, all along the while. Um, the organization will accept members and will begin actively recruiting members sometime in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, they do have an application now, and somebody could call up NARF or, or email and, and request an application, and we could get that out to anybody who wants to become involved and, and be you know keep up a little bit better. Good. Since we're talking about that, Brett, why don't you give us those uh, contact numbers or website or whatever you think is the best way for people to reach you? I think for right now, probably... It, they could email me. That's Shelton at NARF dot org. S H E L T O N at N A R F dot org, or call three zero three four four seven eight seven six zero, and ask for Brett Shelton, and then just request a um, request an application to join the the healing coalition for the boarding school. Okay, let me make sure I've got that information down. So if you are listening today to American Indian Living, you've been engaged by this subject. Maybe you yourself have gone through uh, some real serious trauma as a result of uh, boarding school experience. Maybe it wasn't that dramatic, but you want to be heard, or maybe you're suffering from some of this historical or intergenerational trauma. Whatever it is, whatever your concern is, if you want more information and want to consider a membership in this organization, contact Brett. Uh, that's Brett Shelton. His email address is Shelton, S H E L T O N at NARF, that's N-A-R-F dot O-R-G. I've got that email right, uh, Brett? Yes, you do. And I, and I should point out, David, that people should contact me if they're interested in joining the organization, but if they have traumas that they'd like to talk about and work through, it might be better to talk to somebody who's a professional dealing with those sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not a counselor or a therapist, and they'll be better served to get help from somebody who's good at that. These are really important issues, too. Yeah, I appreciate that clarification, because you are, are an attorney by training, right? That's right. I might I might cause somebody to need to see a therapist <laughs> rather than act as a therapist. <laughs> Listen, be before we slip away, we, we, we our time in this segment is running out. Let's make sure we get that phone number out as well. So we've got the email, shelton at narf.org. Brett, give us one more time the phone number. 303-447-8760. Okay, so one more time. It's 303-447-8760. If you want to become a member of the uh, the coalition, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, that is contact information that you want to jot down and, and utilize. We are going away just for a couple of minutes, but we will be right back. Uh, Denise, Brett, and I are staying by. You stay by, too. We've got a lot more to talk about as far as the boarding school experience, things that can make a difference in your life and the lives of those you love. Stay tuned. American Indian Living will continue in a moment. If you have questions or comments about today's pre-recorded broadcast, please call 1-800-775-HOPE. That's 1-800-775-4673. America's veterans have served our country in both war and peace. It's because of people like you that we are free. My class was learning about war and how hard it is. I wanted to do something to let them know how I feel. Now there is a way to thank them for helping keep America free. Log on to thankyouveterans.org and type a personal message of thanks. Dear Dad, I've recently come to understand how important your service to America was, and I just wanted to say thank you. There are 26 million veterans living in America today. 
from World War II to Afghanistan and Iraq. We carry our experiences inside. It's nice to have someone say thanks. Let a veteran know you appreciate their service. Log on to thankyouveterans.org, a public service of Paralyzed Veterans of America. You're listening to Dr. David DeRose on American Indian Living. Your comments and questions are welcome. Call now at 1-800-775-HOPE, 1-800-775-4673. Here again is Dr. DeRose. Welcome back to American Indian Living. Dr. David DeRose hosting a special show speaking about the boarding school experience and some of the challenges that we're still facing throughout Indian country as a result of that whole experience that uh, has impacted tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Native Americans. One of them is Denise Lajmodir. Denise uh, has her doctorate in educational leadership. She's on the faculty of North Dakota State University, and she is the president of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Denise, we've been speaking about this whole phenomenon. We've identified uh, a little bit about some of the trauma that people went through in the boarding schools. We've talked about the intergenerational effects, how future generations, even those who were not in those situations, have been suffering throughout Indian country. We want to speak a little in this segment about some of the hope and some of the hopes for resolution. You've seen some tremendous progress made in your own life. What do you see as a researcher and in your own experience that can bring healing to Indian country in this whole area? In my research of interviewing the people, first of all, I wanted to document just what had happened to these people at boarding schools. So I had people, about 20, call me from throughout North Dakota and Minnesota. And if anyone knows anything about qualitative research, we look at things that emerge from the study. And the participants, they experience a lot of loss, of course. They loss of identity, our language, our culture, our ceremonies, our traditions. They had loss of self-esteem, uh, loneliness due to loss of parents and extended family. They felt abandonment by their parents. They felt lost and out of place once they returned home. I call them the returned. Um, they just they didn't fit once they went back home. Another theme that came about, of course, is that the these participants uh, experienced severe abuse in the form of corporal punishment, mm. forced child labor, a program called the Outing Program. Uh, they were hungry, they were malnourished, and there was uh, rampant sexual and mental abuse. They also experienced what we just talked about, unresolved grief, mostly because of maintaining silence. They had mental health issues, they had relationship issues, and alcohol abuse. So, you know, I think of my father... He was there in the 1920s, and it was still the saying, you know, the, the Indian and you shall die, and kill the Indian, save the man. And mm. he was also, of course, the forced child labor and, and the beatings. So at the end of the interview, I asked the participants, mm -hmm. what, would, what would heal you? Mm -hmm. and, and they said, of, of course, forgiveness. They needed to forgive. And they also, some of them talked about if the United States would, would issue an apology. Mm -hmm. Other people said, an apology will do no good. I will never get my childhood back. Mm -hmm. So, But for us, as a healing coalition, we're looking at all of this. All of us are, are trying to deal with who we are, our identity as Native people, uh, bringing our language back, doing language immersion camps in schools, returning to our culture and our ceremonies, and traditions, it was maybe 25 years ago when our tribe started bringing back the sweat lodge and the, the rain dance ceremonies at home, and the, the Christian churches just went nuts. It was, they just went, it was like they got hysterical, going back to the blanket. But that was our way of, of healing uh, ourselves. Uh, lots of self-esteem and loneliness. That, you know, there... This this one girl I was interviewing her mother. She she has long, since passed on. She's about seventy eight years old. But her daughter said, now she understood. And then her mom sent her to boarding school. So she had fourteen kids, and she said, "Well, mom, you know, I know I never feel at home. I've just been traveling all over, all over." Mm -hmm. So she was finally linking her sense of not belonging anywhere to her mother having sent her to boarding school. Wow! And again, it was a moment where 
you know, oh, oh wow, I'm not a counselor. I don't know how to address this, this daughter's issue, but it was very poignant. So we still have, you know, like I said, we need to go to these communities and, and still ask them what, what, is, what type of healing would you see. Um, just even for the government to, to acknowledge. It doesn't have to issue an apology. It's something that we've discussed back and forth uh, as board members. Um, what would a sincere apology look like? Well, that would have to come from the community to the government. We need to develop an, that apology if that's something that we want to do. But just in a recognition from the government that this and the churches that this is what happened. This is what was done to us. This is this is what happened. I think would would help our indigenous people across the United States with starting a healing process. There's models for reconciliation. You know, healing between two groups of people worldwide and in Africa lately, in addition to the to the residential school movement in Canada. There's also been a lot of, you know, group reconciliation attempts in Africa over recent decades. And those models are pretty universal. The first step is, is acknowledgement that something bad happened by both the perpetrator and by the victims. Mm -hmm. Both sides have to be honest about what really did happen. And from there you can move forward. But but to this point, this has been an untold story in American history. I mean, we all have family stories and so on, but it's not taught in schools. And, and uh, you know, mainstream America largely doesn't even know what, what they did to Native children. You know, since we're mentioning that, that huge knowledge gap, can you give us, uh, for some of those, maybe even in Indian country, younger people, they may even be hearing about this for the first time. They may be living in an urban area. They've never heard this subject. Can you give us a little perspective on the, the boarding school experience? When was this uh, in effect? Uh, where did it happen? Give us just a little bit more uh, detail about it. You want to go into the history, Brett? <laughs> started in 1819 with uh, President Grant. Is, is that where you're going? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, 1819, the Indian Civilization Fund Act, and that was an act um, passed by Congress at the request of several denominations of Christians at the time. Um, and the idea was that, that the churches saw a lot of death happening in Indian country and wanted to do what they thought was the best thing, which was to educate the native people into the, into the uh, Anglo-European traditions and away from their tribal traditions. That, uh, for the most part, those earlier schools were near the reservations, and then that was seen as a problem after a while because the children still went home to their parents or their families and became basically indoctrinated in the cultures of their tribes as, as well they should be. <laughs> and so, but that was frustrating to the people who were trying to get them to unlearn their tribal traditions. And um, By 1869, President, as part of President Grant's peace policy, um, there was a Board of Indian Commissioners set up, and uh, funding began to, to take place for uh, residential schools or off, way off-site boarding schools. And so we had, uh, first we had Carlisle formed, I guess, and then, uh, what was Chimala. the second school? Yeah, then Chamawa in Oregon. And, uh, you know, from there, it, it took off. And the idea was you need to get the kids away from the families, because otherwise they just go home and learn about their tribal cultures. <laughs> so if you're trying to beat their cultures out of them, then you got to have them further away from home. And, um, Captain Pratt, the, the man who started this, uh, he was, he came out of the Civil War, so he was a, a war captain, and he led the boarding schools in a mil military style. And his colleague, Wilkinson, is the one that in 1880, I think the person was 1879, and then 1880 with Chamawa, he went out and did the similar boarding school based on military, where they, they had to march. My father, in 1925, still had to march with the wooden guns. They had to march wherever they went. There was um, revelry in the morning and bells and whistles that uh, made their days. There was uh, a little outside jail where where he was sent. Uh, they, he couldn't. He just couldn't learn to speak English, and so the corporal punishment. You know, the kids were pins were stuck through their tongues that they couldn't speak English. But but again, that, like what Brett was saying, he he would. They moved the kids from on reservation boarding schools and church schools to off reservation, so they could be even further away from from their, their people and, and from their families. So it started with Richard Pratt, and I have a, a uh, thesis that I just um, discovered. It was done in 2011 on 
Chamawa as 1960s and 70s by Melissa R-U-H-L Rule. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the assimilation policies that were still very rampant in Christianization policies in, in that boarding school as late as the 1970s. Another uh, thesis that we had that Brett brought to our attention was done on Carlisle, and it was about the mortality rate at Carlisle. That's something I, I knew kids mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. I knew my father saw a kid being beaten to death by that gauntlet that wow. he was part of, and that there was there's uh, cemeteries by every boarding school. But this this student at uh, Dartmouth College, uh, Preston McBride, he goes deeply into the murders and the deaths that, that happened at Carlisle and, and the number of students that were sent home that we'll never know about that were sent home to die. Mm -hmm. So it was an extraordinary death rate at the boarding schools. Um, the one in Kansas, um, what's the one in Kansas? Haskell, they built that school and sent kids there before they were finished building the buildings and kids froze to death there. Um, kids died of loneliness. My dad said somebody died in the bed next to him and I said, what happened? He said, he just quit eating, he died. And now we know that that's failure to thrive. Mm -hmm. These kids just experienced so much trauma that it led them to, to become so sick that they died. So we're still finding information. I need someone to go out there and, and help research how many boarding school survivors we still have. Canada knows that there's 80,000 survivors. 40,000, they said, came forward to um, testify that they were, they were a survivor. Mm -hmm. And then they have, I think, 4,000 uh, other people that d gave testimony in the Truth and Reconciliation. We don't even know how many survivors are still out there in the United States. We need help and financing to even um, to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the, the challenges that you folks are at. You're a new organization. You're just getting your 501c3. Uh, that's in the works, correct? Yes. Yeah. And so right now you've got a pretty ambitious agenda and the funds are getting tight. Have I sized that up correctly? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll let Brett talk about our fundraising. Yeah, I mean, the the challenge is funding for this sort of an activity. That, I mean, everybody agrees once they understand what's happened that, that we should do something to make stuff right. The problem is how do you find how do you find funds to support that in tight times like this? I mean, the, the federal government isn't going to be forthcoming with money to support what we want to do or anything. Um, so that's part of the challenge that the coalition faces is how to how to fund this and you know among our expenses right now we go out and uh, spread the word about what we're up to and and see if that's something that tribes are on board with for example um, so we've been going to regional tribal meetings and and getting resolutions of support for what we're doing and and just providing education about what we're up to and um, that costs money. Um, typically, Denise will go, or I'll go, or my colleague Don Warden from the Native American Rights Fund. We keep the the travel bills as low as we can, but we do try to get out and talk with people. Um, we do shows like this when we get a chance to, because that's a, a way to get the word out to a lot more people. And um, a lot, and we're all volunteers. Brett and Don are lawyers at NARF, and I'm a professor, and I'm in the middle of reading final papers right now. So we're we're, we're overwhelmed with our regular jobs. So Everything that we've done at the national level right now and, and working on this is completely volunteer, and the same with the rest of the board. Extraordinary people. Yeah. Very we have dedicated. no staff. We have people, dedicated right. people, giving a lot of their time and effort. I really appreciate what you folks are sharing, uh, your service to this whole cause, as well as pulling away from your busy schedules to do the uh, interview today. We have still got another segment, and we want to get some information out to people as to how they can help be a part of uh, what the coalition is doing. We're going to have that information and more as we come back for our final segment. Don't go away. I'm Dr. DeRose. You're listening to American Indian Living. Today's broadcast has been pre-recorded. However, if you have questions about today's show or would like further information, please call one 800 775 hope that's 1-800-775-4673 we'll be right back after this today's american indian living radio program is sponsored in part by weimar center of health and education located in the foothills of northern california's sierra mountains weimar is home to the residential new start lifestyle program that helps people of all races address diabetes, heart disease, 
obesity, and related conditions. To further assist Native Americans with their health, Weimar produces a wealth of free resources that can be accessed on their website at newstartclub.com. To learn more about how Weimar can change your life, you can call 1-800-525-9192. The number again is 1-800-525-9192. Or you can access them on the web at newstartclub.com. Again, that's newstartclub.com. of steel, with incomparable courage, with fierce determination, with uncompromising resolve, the men and women of the United States Armed Forces go forth. And wherever and whenever they go, the USO will be there to touch their spirit, to comfort them, to remind them, to simply and heartfully thank them for the extraordinary gift they give us all. Until every brow is soothed and every hand is held, until every battle's won and every song is sung, until everyone comes home. Find out more about the USO and how you can help at uso.org. You're listening to Dr. David DeRose on American Indian Living. Your comments and questions are welcome. Call now at 1-800-775-HOPE, 1-800-775-4673. Here again is Dr. DeRose. Welcome back to our final segment of today's edition of American Indian Living. Dr. David DeRose with Denise Lajemodier and... With Brett Shelton, we're speaking about the boarding school experience in Indian country, and we want to give you an opportunity to help be a part of the solution. Before we do that, though, before we give out a little bit more opportunity and information for you to contribute, uh, be more of an active part of the coalition, I think it's important that we talk a little bit more about something that's come up several times, and that's the whole area of forgiveness. We've talked about spirituality, native spirituality. We've talked about some of the sad history where some Christian churches were actually involved in some of the original, uh, the roots of this boarding school uh, experience. And yet at the same time, many people throughout Indian country see Christian churches and other churches or other spiritual communities beside traditional Native American worship practices as being a source of spiritual strength and meaning for them. So when we speak about forgiveness, I guess one of the questions is, where do Christian listeners, Native Americans who still relate to a Christian identity, are? is that part of the problem? Are they part of the solution? How do you see that, Brett? Um, I don't know, but I, 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 well, actually, churches are a big part of the solution, um, and they're, we've been working with churches around the country, and the the project has been well received. Churches are generally willing to get on board, is what we're finding, mm-hmm. and that's great because um, you know they do have some of the denominations do have mud on their hands from the from the past, um, the policy may have been well-intentioned, but it was ill-conceived. Uh, you know, cultural genocide was not a good idea, and that's become clear now. Mm-hmm. And churches seem to want to be able to, to uh, have some sort of redress around that, too. They want to, uh, you know, repentance, I guess, is, is the idea. Um, and churches have been struggling. This is a natural growth out of what churches have been doing in recent times. Mm-hmm. Recall that the World Council of Churches has, um, in recent years, called for renouncing the doctrine of discovery. And without going into too much detail, that's kind of what motivated the whole colonization of of indigenous America. Mm -hmm. Um, And churches have been actively pursuing renunciation of that doctrine and all that it brought. Now, that's pretty theoretical, but this is a chance to deal with with some of the incidents of colonization and of of cultural genocide that, that are more specific. And, you know, for example, we've been meeting with the Council of Native American Ministries, which is basically the Native American desks at, at several of the major denominations in the United States. And that group has been on board and has been helping us conduct outreach to the various denominations that they represent. 
And just last week, um, the project was in Washington, D.C. We were invited by the Friends Committee on National Legislation. That's a, that's a, a group that works on legislation on behalf of the Quaker churches. Mm -hmm. And they convened all kinds of Christian denominations to come in for a briefing about specifically the boarding school policy. Um, it was very well received. We've got a lot of follow-up activity going on. We already had a nice article come out in the Sojourner magazine, which I believe people could get to on the on the web. Um, it was on a blog on there. So it's uh, it's been pretty exciting because uh, the churches do stand to gain in, in terms of, of uh, basically repenting for, for any harm that they might have caused in, in the past, and they seem eager to want to do that overall once they understand what went on. And they can also serve as a great forum for educating about what happened. Remember that that one of the big problems with the boarding schools is that this is one of the dirty little secrets of the United States. Well, the churches can actually start talking about it and say, this really happened and we need to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So even even out in the communities where the churches are themselves, that can be part of, of what they actually talk about. Excellent points, excellent. And so people tuning in today, listeners throughout Indian country, individuals who don't even have Native American roots, who are hearing about really this human rights trauma issue, if you will, this cultural genocide as we've been speaking about it, and say, I want to make a difference, you do have opportunities for people to partner with you financially. Isn't that right? Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the project needs support from anywhere that it can get it, actually. And how does someone go about making a difference financially in the, in the equation? Well, right now, since the, uh, the 501c3 application is still pending for the Healing Coalition, the Native American Rights Fund serves as the, the fiscal agent for the Healing Coalition in the interim. So, so donations can be sent in care of the Boarding School Healing Coalition to the Native American Rights Fund. And they would use that same contact information you gave out earlier, uh, Brett? Absolutely, yeah. And they could also check the World Wide Web, too, um, www.narf.org, or just Google Native American Rights Fund. Okay, very good. Native American Rights Fund, that's NARF, narf.org. And if you weren't with us earlier in the show, you can get a hold of Brett directly using email at Shelton, S-H-E-L-T-O-N, at narf.org. And you've got a phone number as well, right, Brett? Yes, we do. It's 303-447-8760. Okay, if you didn't get that the first time around, area code 303-447-8760. Well, Denise and Brett, as we're in kind of the home stretch of today's show, We've still got an opportunity to give some uh, more of the things that you see that are the encouraging lights out there on the horizon as we speak about a, uh, an issue that has traumatized generations of First Nation peoples. Give us a little bit more uh, hope and encouragement as we're closing out today's show. My, my personal encouragement is to all of the indigenous and Native people that are listening to go and talk to your elders um, get a tape recorder or a pencil and paper and encourage them to talk, but also to have that support system or encourage them to go into therapy or counseling. A lot of the, uh, whenever I see someone on the downtown streets of Fargo who is alcoholic and, and inebriated, I want to jump out of my car and, and grab them and ask them what boarding school they went to. It's, mm -hmm. it's the overarching uh, issue. I think even diabetes, they say, stems from from boarding schools in Indian country. You know, I think of my father that was a subsistence hunter in wonderful gardens and playing in the lake and fishing and then was sent to boarding school where he about starved to death on postum coffee and, wow. and uh, breakfast that had um, um, worms in it and so on. So, but I want, I want more stories. I want, I want everyone's, every survivor's story um, told. It's sort of like the Holocaust survivors right now are dying. Um, that generation, I don't ever want you know, to, for us to forget uh, what happened to us. I tell my grandkids, and I'm going to be a great-grandma in uh, seven months, so <laughs> I don't ever want my children and grandchildren and my great-grandchildren to forget what happened to us. And, and I want my children to understand why I was the way I was, the way I raised them. I had trouble telling my kids I loved them and hugging them, mm -hmm. and now I understand why. So, but, but we have to talk. We have to get our elders 
to talk. And it, if someone's alcoholic or, or has emotional issues, it could be because they're a boarding school survivor or their, or their parents were or their grandparents were. So record their stories and talk to them and encourage our people to, to get help through ceremony, um, or through church, or through counseling, whatever it takes. But I want stories. I want everyone to record um, their survivor stories. This is such a great message, Denise, because that's really one of the themes we've been talking about, this theme of truth. Before we can have reconciliation and forgiveness, we have to know what's happened. We have to have the the, the details out there. So uh, thank you for giving that, that real strong encouragement. For those tuning in today, to, to share your stories, record them, uh, get the word out there. Brett, what about from your perspective? From my perspective, in terms of encouragement, I would like to... Uh, to point out that, that people really ought to have hope. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel here. There are tribally specific healing models that are popping up in different places around the country. Um, and the trauma scientists, if you ask them what does it take to heal from this historical trauma that people seem to be experiencing in our communities and our families, and if you tell them about these tribal healing models, they go, that's, that's the sort of stuff that should work. So everything's coming together. There is hope. There's light at the end of the tunnel, and it all seems to be coming together now. As though this is the time to start dealing with this, and uh, that keeps keeps my fire lit and burning strong. The healing's hard work, but but we have the chance to earn freedom from from all of this trauma. Well, we're sure glad there are folks like you, Denise and Brett, who are out there. And if you want to be a part of the solution, if you want to actually become a member of the coalition, if you want to help financially, let me give you that contact information again. You can get a hold of Brett Shelton simply by emailing him at shelton at narf.org, or you can call 303 447 8760, or you can just go to the website for the Native American Rights Fund, narf.org. Again, Brett and Denise, thank you so much for squeezing time in and your very busy schedules. Well, thank you. We're glad to get the word out. We've got to go. I'm Dr. David DeRose. Hopefully today's show has brought you some more light into a very important topic and will help make a difference in your life and in the lives of those you love. For all of us at American Indian Living, I'm Dr. David DeRose wishing you the very best of health. <laughs>